Hi there, it's the late summer garden tour and it's Alexandra from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog and it has been really hot. Here in the UK we've had the warmest August week since 1961 and here in South East England in Kent where the Middle Size Garden is and it's approximately a USDA zone 9 it has been really warm because we are sort of the warmest part of the UK. And although some parts of the UK have got floods and storms, we have had no rain at all. So I'm going to take you around the garden and look at the plants which I really have to water and which plants I don't have to water because that might help you. And of course, it, in terms of time and effort and, and the money that water costs, it's really helpful to use the minimum amount of water we can. I definitely start with the lawn. As I've said before, this year we've been running something called a nectar lawn, which isn't exactly a meadow lawn, but it is allowing the lawn to grow a little bit longer and to allow some low flowers to grow for pollinators. It obviously means less mowing, so it's less work. And we don't irrigate the lawn because it goes brown and it'll come back again. So there are a lot of advantages to this. It's less work, we spend less time and less money and we don't irrigate. However, it doesn't look as good. So this is really a question of choice and what's important to you. And I think another factor here in this garden is that we've got really proportionately quite a large amount of space that's lawn. So if we were to irrigate, that would use really quite a lot of water. I recently did a video about how to make Make an amazing herbaceous border and I'll leave that link in the description below and one of the things that the owner said was that having a really beautiful green lawn makes your borders look much better and that's absolutely true it really does so you have choices to make and it's just about finding out what's right for you and for your lifestyle and for us it's not watering the lawn and not mowing it so often and letting these little tiny flowers bounce up but there are a few plants that I do water and one of them is cannas Cannas use quite a lot of water and they'll grow better and there's only three of them so I have been watering those. Pots of course need watering the whole time because they only have the food and the water that you give them. So when I'm watering the pots I also do put some water into the base of the cannas. I don't have any newly planted shrubs in the garden at the moment and if I did I would have to water those because for the first year shrubs and trees don't really get their roots deep enough down in order to benefit from the lower levels of water deep under the soil. And I wouldn't normally irrigate any trees but there is one tree here which is only about three years old and it's a silver birch and they quite like water so I've been putting the hose on very low and leaving it there just by the roots of the tree for about half an hour so that the water will really sink in deep. What you want to avoid when watering something like a tree and a shrub is putting a lot of water on the surface because then the roots never do go down deep. These acanthus mollusks or bear's britches do manage drought pretty well but as you can see their leaves are so yellow and it really looks awful. So I asked a garden designer friend of mine if she thought I ought to water the acanthus mollusks and she said well I saw some acanthus mollusks last year and a car had crashed into them and then the car burnt out and it completely burnt the acanthus mollusks but they were absolutely back fine this year so I think I think if acanthus mollusks can deal with a car crash and a fire, they can probably manage six or seven weeks of drought. So I'm not going to water those and I'll keep my fingers crossed. Of course, I have to water the veg. Veg needs watering every day. And while we're in the veg patch, there's a very useful lesson as to why I am such a terrible veg gardener. I planted two courgette plants from seeds. They're exactly the same sort of courgette and I planted them out on exactly the same day. But one of them had some self-seeded stachys and some alcamilla mollis around it. And it looked so pretty that I left it. Now that courgette has barely grown. Whereas the other courgette, the identical one, which is quite nearby and hasn't got any plants or weeds around it, is more than double the size. So 
Vegetables just don't like competition, and I really should know that. Deadheading is the other big thing for the late summer garden. And of course, I'm deadheading dahlias and roses. I'm not deadheading anything where I want the seed heads for the autumn and winter color or to leave the birds. But this echinops here, which the bees adore and is absolutely enormous, I'm going to cut down right to the ground. And last year I got a second flush. It wasn't as tall, it wasn't over my head, it was just up to my knees. And those seeds I did leave over the autumn and winter, partly because the birds enjoy them and partly because they make a nice shape in the winter garden. I'm deadheading cosmos and these cosmos were given to me by a friend of mine and they are such a useful plant to fill a gap. I really think that next year I'm going to grow a whole load of cosmos from seeds and just pop them in wherever I've got a space because they're so light and airy they don't crowd other flowers. If you deadhead them frequently they just flower and flower and flower and they're really pretty and I think they sort of fit into any kind of colour scheme. And talking about dahlias, this dahlia here three weeks ago was absolutely covered with aphids and I really wish I'd taken a photograph to show it to you. I'd just been to interview Neil Miller at Hever Castle and I'd asked him what he did about aphids on his roses and he said well there's about two or three weeks a year when the roses are just covered in aphids but we don't do anything, we just leave them and the predators build up and then they're gone. So when I saw this dahlia about three weeks ago, it was absolutely thick with aphids and I was with a friend of mine and she said, well, of course, I think Nick Miller would say, you just leave it. So I thought, well, I'll just leave it. And it is amazing. The aphids have just gone without my doing anything. I think you can see a few little black specks on this plant and that's all. The cotinus always is affected by the heat. This is a lovely old shrub, it's called Cotinus cagaria grace, and it is pretty much on the way out, and every year a chunk of it dies, particularly in very hot weather. But we simply cut it back, and then the new growth is just a lovely colour, and we think it'll probably live in the garden for at least another five years. One plant that I usually have to water in dry weather is hydrangeas. What I notice is I'll come out into the garden and I'll just see the hydrangeas just wilting and I'll give them a really good long watering around their base and they're usually fine for another three, four weeks and they might need one other water. I'm slightly surprised to see that the hydrangeas haven't wilted in this heat or in this dryness and I think it might be because they've been there for a long time and their roots have really got deep down into the soil and we had a very wet spring so I imagine there's still some moisture a few feet down in the soil or it may be that the hydrangeas will wilt in a couple of days time if we don't have any rain. You can catch up with the middle-sized garden through the seasons in the playlist at the end of this video and there are tips for every month and if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden then do subscribe to the middle-sized garden and thank you for watching. Goodbye.